Praise the Lord, everyone. It's so good to be in church tonight. Thank the Lord for his blessings. Welcome to the Apostolic Church in Whitesboro. And we are so blessed to be in God's presence and able to serve him and to worship him. And that's what we want to do right now is to worship the Lord and lift him up and just invite his blessings into our hearts. Hallelujah. We love you, Jesus. You are worthy. Thank you for your blessings and your presence. Thank you for your touch, Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you. 
anointing that breaks the yokes and the bonds of sin. It is the power that comes through that name, the blood that was shed for our redemption. Oh, is in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Oh, let's clap our hands and thank you for his blessings in this place tonight. Thank you, Lord, for the blood you shed. Thank you for the love you've shown. And thank you for giving us access to your throne through the name of Jesus and your precious blood, Lord. It cleanses us from all our iniquities. And we love you for it, Jesus. Hallelujah. We are ever mindful of your sacrifice and your blessings. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Amen. What a wonderful Redeemer. What a great God. And we know him. And best of all, he knows us. He knows you. Amen. And he is with us. Praise the Lord. I saw a church sign today and it says that uh, Jesus or God has plan has a plan for where you are right now and so for those that are out there that are in a world of hurt and problems and trials and struggles God's got a plan for you amen I believe it he's got it all worked out he's got it all figured out all we have to do is give him access invite him into it amen and he will do amazing things through it. Hallelujah. Amen. So thankful that we can worship in song. The song is a wonderful way to leave the world behind and enter into his presence and just kind of forget all that other stuff for a while and just allow him to be our focus. Amen. I love to sing and worship the Lord and sing songs of worship to him. Praise God. Amen. We are thankful to be here tonight. Thankful for the word of the Lord. Can somebody say amen? amen? The word is such a wonderful, wonderful gift that God has given us. I, I appreciate his word so immensely and thank God so much for what he has given us through his word and the power that we have, the knowledge that we have, the blessings that we have through his word. It is incredible. And I hope to encourage someone tonight and to invite you to take advantage of what God has made available to all that will call upon his name. And we find in the scriptures that there are many places in the New Testament where we are admonished or encouraged to hold fast until Jesus comes. How many know Jesus is coming soon? Amen. He's not very far off. And uh, for those... The, the people who don't even live for God are more aware of it, I think, sometimes than this church is because I have people who don't even go to church who constantly mention to me that, uh, boy, you can tell that the end is coming. <laughs> Amen. Well, brother, you need to be in church. <laughs> Amen. And uh, we, the church, the body of believers, we ought to be holding fast, holding on to everything God has given us and commanded us until he comes. Can somebody say amen to that? Amen. I want to start out with Hebrews chapter 3 and verse 6. We will open up with that. If you're able to stand in honor of the word of the Lord tonight, we will do that. I so appreciate his word. Amen. And what he has given us, it is powerful. I rejoice to be able to read the word, to study the scriptures. I love to hear the word. Uh, it just, uh, and I guess... It helps having the Holy Ghost because the Spirit of God in you, uh, as soon as you, you've heard a, heard a chapter, a verse over, over, over maybe, and uh, you hear it again and you go, oh, that's good. Oh, I like that. Amen. It's like you're hearing it for the first time sometimes. Hebrews chapter 3 and verse 6, Paul writes, But Christ as a son over his own house, whose house are we, if, somebody say if, if. we hold fast. The confidence and the rejoicing of the hope firm until the end. Amen. We are the tabernacle of God. Amen. God no longer dwells in buildings made with men's hands, but he dwells in the fleshy tabernacle of the heart in the power of the Holy Ghost or the Holy Spirit. And God's Spirit is here tonight to minister, and his word is alive and fresh. Father, we thank you for it tonight. We ask you to minister in our hearts. And let this word encourage the believers. God, let it encourage someone to become a believer, we pray. And Lord, as your anointing flows through our hearts, reminding us 
of all that you have made possible for us. May we hold on to that until you come. In Jesus' name, somebody said amen. 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 You may be seated. God bless you. Paul was admonishing the church to hold fast to the confidence we should have great confidence in what God has done for us. It's not about what I can do, and it's not about what you can do, but it's about what He has done. Amen. And as we submit ourselves to His will and to His word, then we can have great confidence in what He has done because He has paid the price already. He has bought the ticket. It's done. Amen. All we have to do is just live for Him, and He will see us through. And I appreciate that so much. In 1 Thessalonians, we'll turn back into the scriptures just a little ways. 1 Thessalonians 5. And verse 14. Thessalonians 5 and verse 14. <coughs> We need to hold fast to that which is good. Philippians 4 and 8 through 13, I think it is, admonishes us what sort of things are good, pure, wholesome, and virtuous. There's any praise. It says to think on these things. We need to hold fast to the good things that we have in the Lord. 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 14, Paul writes, Now we exhort you, encourage you greatly, brethren, warn them that are unruly, Comfort the feeble-minded, support the weak, be patient toward all men. See that none render evil for evil unto any man. Well, that's a challenge, isn't it? We have such a strong tendency, and in our, in our culture today is uh, through media and through uh, movies and so on, there is such a revenge, get even, pay back, you know, catch the bad guy, and um, rendering evil for evil. And uh, that's, that's one. But he says, let's see that none render evil for evil unto any man, but ever follow that which is good, both among yourselves and to all men. Rejoice evermore. We should always be rejoicing in the Lord. Pray without ceasing. How can you do that? Having an attitude of prayer. Talking to the Lord all the time. Amen. I do. Uh, there's times I'm praying for people. There's times I'm just thanking the Lord. There's times I'm singing a song to Him. Amen. We can have a spirit of prayer in our life. Verse 18, in everything, give thanks. This is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. But say, wait a minute. Do you know what just happened to me? Amen. Well, Romans 8, 28 says that it's all working together to the good of those who love the Lord and are the called according to his purpose. So that means that God's doing something good. And you can't thank him for it. Amen. Even though at the time it seems bad. And even though at the time it doesn't seem like a blessing. But he says in everything, give thanks. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Verse 19, quench not the spirit. We need to encourage the moving of the Holy Ghost and the ministry of the Holy Ghost. Despise not prophesying. Prove all things. And finally, he says, hold fast that which is good. Amen. We need to hold on to the good things. The good teaching of the Word of God. The good people around us. Amen. We need to hold on to the good traditions. We're going to get into that in a little bit. There is so much that God has given us, and we need to hold on to it. In verse 22, he says, abstain or turn away from all appearance of evil. And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. And I pray, God, your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Faithful is he that hath called you who also will do it. Church, we ought to thank God that we can be blameless before his sight. Not because we're worthy, but because he's worthy. Amen. When we serve the Lord with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength, what happens is that he honors us. He covers us. He blesses us. He washes us. Amen. And we are ready when he comes back. When the trumpet sounds, the dead in Christ rise first, and then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up to meet the Lord in the air. There shall we evermore dwell with them. 
I'm thankful that he is the one that will cleanse us and prepare us. But it's going to come from our holding fast to his word, to his teaching, to his doctrine, to his will. And uh, I remember hearing a, a preacher in town one time mention to me, we were at a restaurant, and he made the statement that doctrine is not important. And I just, it shook me to my core because the fact that the sun and the earth revolve around one another and there or the earth revolves around the sun and doesn't collide or drift away, you know why it doesn't? Because the, the word of God told it what to do. It's because of God's doctrine that we have sun in the day and moon at night or uh, we have provision for us, we have rain, we have we are not too hot. We're not too cold. Uh, of course, people in the South say it's too hot. People in the North say it's too cold. <laughs> what I'm talking about is that it's not 300 degrees below zero, and we're not frozen solid. And it's not 700 degrees above zero, and we're all fried. I'm talking about God has provided us a planet, and everything works for us. We're in that what they call the Goldilocks zone. We're on a planet that is perfect for us to inhabit and live on. We have the right amount of oxygen. We have, what, we have everything that we need because God spoke it into existence. That's doctrine. Everything in God's economy, everything in God's creation functions through doctrine. It's God's doctrine, his word. And then we, his creation, can turn around and say, oh, doctrine doesn't matter. Because doctrine is God's word. And if God's word doesn't matter, then we might as well pack up and go home. There ain't nothing, no, no reason to even be here tonight. We are here because of God's word, because of God's doctrine. And we need to hold fast to that doctrine that he wants because there's a lot of propaganda out there. Can somebody say amen? amen. There's a lot of twisting of God's word. There's, and, and not because people are necessarily evil, but because Satan knows that if he can twist the word of God, guess what? He can lead souls astray and destroy them. And this is what breaks God's heart. But if we take and search the scriptures daily, and if we try the word to make sure that it is true, then we will have solid doctrine, and we can hold fast and be kept by the word of God. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 15, we're admonished to hold on to the good traditions. There are some traditions that have been handed down to the church and in our lives, and we need to hold on to these. Second Thessalonians 2 and verse 15, he says, Therefore, brethren, stand fast and hold the traditions which you have been taught, whether by word or epistle. Now our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God, even our Father, which hath loved us, hath given us and everlasting consolation and good hope through grace. And it's very important that we hold on to the good traditions. Now, traditions are kind of uh, interesting because there are some traditions that are not necessary to hang on to. At the time, they may have been good, and there are things that we have all experienced if we live for God any time. I've been in the church for 45 years now, roughly, and there are some things that have been taught that are not necessary to be taught now. And that was a tradition for a while, but it's no longer necessary. And uh, I use this example that was passed on to me. There was a woman who was uh, cutting the ends off a roast to put it in the oven. And the husband asked her, said, hon, why are you cutting the ends of the roast off to put it in the oven? And she said, well, mom used to always do that. And he said, well, why? I don't know. I'll call mom. Find out. She calls her mom up. Her mom says, well, honey, I don't know why. Your grandma used to do that. And so I, I just, that's the way I prepare my roast. And so... Uh, fortunately, Grandma was still around, and so she called Grandma up, and Grandma said, Well, honey, my oven was too small. I couldn't fit it in there, so I had to cut the ends off the roast to get it in there. <laughs> there are some traditions that at the time were necessary, and they were good. But there are some traditions that are kept and held on to by churches and believers, and perhaps there's not a reason for them. But one tradition that Jesus passed on, and that was communion. He said, as often as we do it, we are to do it in remembrance of him and his blood that he shed and his sacrifice on Calvary. There are some traditions that will hold fast until he comes. Amen. And he said, this do in remembrance of me. It reminds us of his sacrifice 
and it gives us an opportunity to connect with him in a very personal way. And, uh, and so there are some traditions that are necessary. We're, we're very traditional about going to church on Wednesdays and Sundays. Amen. And that's a good thing. Praise the Lord. Matter of fact, Hebrews says that as we see the end approaching, we ought to be getting together more often. And uh, maybe that's something we need to pray about. But the Lord knows. Amen. And so holding fast to good traditions, the things that we have been handed down and that help to keep us strong. Holiness. The scriptures talk about holiness. Well, holiness is the result of obeying God's word. And so we should obey God's word in dress, in speech, in habits, in our living. Amen. And so holiness is the result of obedience. And so we need to teach holiness. We need to teach separation from the world. He says, come out from among them and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you unto me. This is part of holding fast. We hold on to the things that God has given us that we need in our lives. There are some things that we need to let go of. There are some things that we left behind in the world and we don't need to pick them back up again. There are some things that we need to get more of in our life. We need more prayer. We need more of the Word of God. We need to draw closer to Him in our walk with the Lord. And so there is much that we have been given and we need to hold on to that. And God will do an incredible work through us if we can do this. In 2 Timothy chapter 1, Paul is teaching young Timothy, admonishing him as he is in the ministry and doing a great work for God and encouraging him. 2 Timothy 1 and verse 13, Paul <clears throat> says to him, Hold fast the form of sound words which thou hast heard of me in faith and love which is in Christ Jesus. That good thing which was committed unto thee, keep by the Holy Ghost which dwelleth in us. We need sound words. We need good teaching. The Word of God challenges us to know them that labor among you. You need to know that I am genuine and real in my walk with God. Otherwise, you don't know what I'm telling you. Many have flattering words. Many have fair speech. Many can be very eloquent, but yet they are not teaching sound doctrine. And so it's very important that we know the Word of God, and it's very important that those that teach us also share that wonderful, solid Word of God, the sound Word of God. In Titus 1, we are challenged to hold fast the faithful Word. God's Word is faithful. Can somebody say amen? amen. God answers prayer. There's power in the name of Jesus. There's power in the blood of Jesus. The gospel saves us from our sins. Not in our sins, from our sins. Amen. In Titus, which is right after 2 Timothy there, 1 and verse 9, he says, Holding fast the faithful word as he hath been taught, that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and to convince the gainsayers. We need to know the Word of God well enough so that when we talk to someone who does not understand or represent the Word of God correctly, we can guide them scripturally into the Word of God and help them to better understand the Word of God. If they're sincere, there is a challenge. There are many that are not sincere and will reject even though you share sound word with them. Amen. And we do that in love. The Bible says, speak the truth in love. The Word of God, we can, uh, uh, my first pastor used this analogy, there's probably not a dog running around in this town that would not love to have a T-bone steak. But if you beat that dog with that steak, he's going to run from it. And we can do that with truth. Everybody, I don't think you'll run into anybody who will tell you that, oh, I don't want truth. They want truth. But if we beat them with it, if we abuse them with the truth and hurt them with the truth, they're not going to want anything to do with us. And so we need to speak the truth in love. He says, holding fast, verse 9, the faithful word as he has been taught, that he may be able to, by sound doctrine, both to exhort and convince the gainsayers. 
For there are many unruly and vain talkers or empty talkers and deceivers, especially they of the circumcision. He's talking about the Jews now. Whose mouths must be stopped. Who subvert whole houses, teaching things which they ought not. For filthy lucre's sake, they're doing it for money. One of themselves, even a prophet of their own, said that the Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, and slow bellies. That's interesting communication. This witness is true. Wherefore, rebuke them sharply that they may be sound in the faith, not giving heed to Jewish fables. See, there's a lot of teaching out there, a lot of stories out there, and whether people realize it, they are being taught fables. Now, this is dealing with the Jews, but we're dealing with Christianity today, and it's the same thing. We have a lot of teachings in Christianity today that are not solid word, they're not sound doctrine. Yes, sir? What's a slow belly? That's a good question. He says evil beasts and slow bellies and liars. Yeah, that's why I said it's an interesting form of communication. <laughs> I'm sure I could look it up in the Greek and we could have a little bit better understanding of what a slow belly is. But I've got a feeling that they're liars. And, uh, and so you don't want to have anything to do with that. And that's what he's dealing with through this whole thing, if you look at it, is false teaching and fables and, and teaching uh, lies and deception. And uh, he says in verse 14, not giving heed to Jewish fables and commandments of men that turn from the truth. Unto the pure, all things are pure. But unto them that are defiled and unbelieving is nothing pure. But even their mind and conscience is defiled. A liar thinks everybody else is lying to them. A person who always tells the truth wants to believe that people are telling them the truth. And that's what he's talking about here. Verse 16. They profess that they know God, but in works they deny him. Being abominable and disobedient and unto every good work reprobate. And so he is warning us that we need to hold fast the faithful word. How are we going to know if someone is telling us a lie? Does it line up with the word of God? How are we going to know if the, if the teaching that they are sharing with us is validated unless we compare it to the word of God? And if we take it to the word of God and the word of God does not back it up, then we go, oh, wait a minute. Something's wrong here. Their doctrine is faulty. God's doctrine is good. But there's a lot of false doctrines in this world around us today, church. And if we want to be with him when the trumpet sounds, we're going to have to hold fast to truth. Sound words are very vital to our walk with God. Hebrews, moving just a little bit farther into the New Testament. Hebrews 4 and verse 14. Seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. Amen. We have committed ourselves to him. Don't let go of that. And there are times in our journey when we may get lax, tired, weary. We, we may back off on the prayer and the word of God and our faithfulness. But we need to shake ourselves, and we need to wake ourselves, and we need to hold fast to what we've been given. Amen. And come back to that relationship. He will always be right where we leave him. So we need to get back to that point where it was. If we drift away or we allow ourselves to be careless uh, or even hurt, injured, there are people that are spiritually are hurt. They're wounded. Sometimes the ministry wounds them. Sometimes people wound them. And they just give up. Don't ever give up on Jesus. Amen. Hold fast to him. And even though we are wounded in church, we still need church. And I know of many that they say, well, the church is full of hypocrites. Well, if you let them keep you out of church, then they're between you and heaven. Because they're closer to God than you are. They're hypocrites. Because we need to be in church. Hebrews tells us that we need to gather together all the more often as we see that day approaching. So we need to gather. We need to be in the house of God. We need to come together to hear this word. Why? Because it exhorts you. It encourages you and I to stay close to him. Amen. 
And if I'm not praying the way I should, guess what? Your prayers are going to encourage me to pray. And my prayers will encourage you to pray. And the word will dwell richly in us and give us strength in our journey. Hebrews 10, just a little bit farther along. And verse 22. Let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that has promised us. Amen. God has given us some great promises. He says in verse 24, And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works. Your holding fast encourages me to hold fast. Your commitment to the word of God encourages me in my commitment to the word of God. Verse 25, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting or encouraging one another. And so much the more as you see the day approaching. For if we sin willfully, and this is an interesting scripture setting that causes many trouble but if we sin willfully, if we continue in sin, is what it's talking about, all right? I think it's important to realize this. He says, if we continue, or if we sin willfully, after that we've received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for our sins. If you keep on living in sin, there's no sacrifice that's going to cleanse you. The sacrifice is not available until we repent and turn from our sinful and wicked ways. So if we keep sinning and keep living in sin, there's no more sacrifice for us, is what it's talking about. Some look at this as, oh, I've sinned the unpardonable sin, and I'm done, and there's no sense even trying. No, it's not talking about that. Amen. It's talking about if you think you can just go on living in sin and you're going to be all right, you're deceived. There is no more sacrifice. He says, but a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation which shall devour the adversaries. He that despised Moses' law died without mercy under two or three witnesses. Of how much sorer punishment suppose ye shall he be thought worthy who hath trodden underfoot the Son of God and hath counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified an unholy thing and hath done despite under the Spirit of grace. For we know <clears throat> for we know him that hath said, Vengeance belongeth unto me. I will recompense, saith the Lord. And again, the Lord shall judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. So for us to continue in sin and ignore repentance, we're dooming ourselves, and God will judge that. There are some today in Christian circles that teach that we're just sinners living in sin, and we're going to be saved by grace. No, we are saved from our sins not in our sins. Amen. We have, that's why Jesus, when he healed people, he told them, go and sin no more. He didn't tell them it's okay to continue on sin and I love you and it's going to be fine. It, he didn't say that anywhere. And nowhere does the scripture back that up. But Christianity today has started a tradition or a fable or something that grace means that God will just love you and forgive you no matter what you're doing. That's not what the scripture says. We need to repent, turn from our wicked ways, and then we can humble our hearts to God and he will cleanse us if we'll obey the gospel, that doctrine. We'll repent, turn from our sins, we'll be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ and that blood of the covenant will be applied through his name and then he will fill us with his anointing, his spirit, the Holy Ghost, and give us power to become witnesses unto him. If... We don't live and walk in sin and just, when God deals with you about something, then you, I have to do something about it. And there are times that God has convicted me of something in my life and I have felt so miserable that I had to get it right. I couldn't keep on doing what I was doing and feel, oh, dear, God doesn't care. If I do that, then I harden my heart to him and then I, I stand the chance of becoming reprobate. Because I don't want to obey God. I refuse to obey God. 
and I will continue on in sin regardless of what he's telling me or trying to get me to do, what his word says, and then I set myself up for unforgiveness. In other words, there won't be a sacrifice. If I get to his throne and God says, well, why didn't you repent? And I say, well, I didn't want to. Well, bless your little heart. You should have. <laughs> Amen. Because the word has already stated what's going to happen. We already know uh, that God will judge his people. Amen. And he says, if judgment began first at the house of God, then he says, what's going to happen to the sinners and the ungodly? So it starts here. We judge ourselves. And when God deals with me about something from his word, it's up to me to line up to that. And then God's blessings can be poured out and he will do great things through our lives. And we are so incredibly privileged because of his word. We're winding down here, Revelations chapter 2 and verse 13. Something we need to hold fast to and something that the devil is trying desperately to take out of the church and out of our salvation. And that is the name of Jesus, Revelations 2 and 13. He's talking to the, to the pastor of the church at Pergamos. In verse 13, he says, I know thy works and where thou dwellest, even where Satan's seat is, and thou holdest fast my name and hast not denied my faith, even in the days when Antipas was my faithful martyr who was slain among you where Satan dwelleth. Church, we got to hold fast the name of Jesus. It's very interesting. So many churches today have taken the name of Jesus out of water baptism. And they use the titles Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. And I don't think they realize what they have done. Because it's through the name that the blood's applied. And so when I go down into that watery grave in Jesus' name, the blood of Jesus is applied to my sins and all my past is put under the blood. When I go down under the water in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, there is no name. Those are titles. There is no blood. There is no remission of sins. And so there is deception. So we need to hold fast to that name. Satan knows that. He doesn't mind if people pray in Jesus' name. He knows God will answer prayers and that will keep them faithful. But if he can keep them from being saved, he did not care how much they pray in Jesus' name. Amen. And I realize we fall into the hands of a merciful and a just God, but his word is still his word. And Jesus said to Nicodemus in John 3, he said, except a man is born of the water, baptized in Jesus' name, and born of the Spirit, filled with the Holy Ghost, he cannot see or enter the kingdom of God. So doctrine, again, very vital, very important. Amen. And thank God it's through the name of Jesus. Colossians 3.17, we won't go there for the sake of time, but you should mark it in your Bibles that uh, whatever you do in word or deed needs to be done in the name. Jesus. And water baptism is both word and deed. It is very vital to our salvation. Finally, in closing, Romans chapter 6 and verse 17. Romans 6 and verse 17 and 18 as we wind this down. Paul writing, I love Romans 6. Romans 6 is dealing strictly almost with water baptism in Jesus' name. And it is through water baptism that our sins are remitted, that we become free from our sins. Verse 17, he says, But God be thanked that you were the servants of sin, but you have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered you. Being then made free from sin, you became the servants of righteousness. Amen. Because we have obeyed from the heart Repentance, water baptism in Jesus' name, and the infilling of the Holy Ghost. We've obeyed God's word, the gospel. Amen. We were made free from sin. Amen. And though Satan brings it up in our remembrance, we can just tell him to get behind me, Satan. I've repented, and it's under the blood. Amen. God doesn't see that. I am free. He that the Son is set free, where it says he's free indeed. Amen. That's the good word. That's faithful. Hallelujah. That's steadfast. It's not going to wash away. Amen. And I love it. There's a song that I, I love to sing. 
and it says the blood's still there, and it's dealing with the young Hebrew child. The Passover lamb has been slain. The blood's been applied to the doorpost, and the death angel is passing over, and the child is scared to death, asking his father, is the blood still there? Because it's storming and going on outside, and the father encourages him to rest assured the blood's still there. It can endure the storm. It doesn't matter what you go through or what I go through. The blood will be there for us when we get to heaven. Amen. And so thank God for his sacrifice. Thank God for your sacrifice. Amen. We have to sacrifice to hold fast. There are some things that we would like to do, but we're like, man, it ain't worth it. I want to please him. I want to honor him. I want to serve him. I want to be like him. Amen. And as we stand to our feet tonight. Let's close and thank God in prayer for what he has done and what he has made available through his word. Father, we thank you so much for the power of the blood that is available through water baptism through the name of Jesus. We are thankful for the anointing power of the Holy Ghost that we can experience as we are filled with your spirit and we speak in a heavenly language, God. And as you reveal yourself to us and God, as we hold on to your word steadfastly, serving you making sure that we walk in truth and not in darkness, God, that we are not deceived, but we are blessed with truth and loving and reaching this world around us. God, you have given us everything we need. And Lord, I pray we are faithful in holding on to it. In Jesus' name, and somebody said, amen. 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 God bless you. You may be seated again.